Hello. Hi. Welcome to the first seminar of the 2024-2025 uh, season of Schwegman, Lundberg, and Woosner's Life Sciences Series. During this series, attorneys from our firm with a background in chemistry and biology will be presenting on various topics involving life sciences and patent law. If you attend three of these seminars live, we will send you a free gift. So I hope that you keep attending uh, more of these seminars. My name is Nicholas Lanzatella. I will be the host for the series and I will also be giving this first presentation. I have a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering, a PhD in organic chemistry. I've been practicing chem pat patent law for about 15 years now, and I'm a principal at SLW. Uh, I usually describe my practice area as engineering chemistry. Uh, I'm an engineer at heart with a strong interest and in knowledge in chemistry. Uh, I spend a lot of time working on polymers and coatings, I spend less time working on pharmaceuticals, but my practice does uh, cover most different chemical areas. Uh, one quick note, standard legal disclaimer, uh, this presentation should not be interpreted as legal advice. Uh, if you need legal advice, you should consult an attorney. And another point I made, wanted to make at the beginning is I will wait till the end to answer questions uh, you can either ask me questions live at the end, or you can feel free to put your questions in the Q&A section uh, of the Zoom software. Um, if I don't have time to get to your questions, I will try to follow up with you uh, via email if you'd like that question answered. And by the way, if I don't get to your questions and you don't have a chance to ask your question, uh, during this presentation. I do love to get emails, so feel free to email me about uh, um, something you have in mind, and I I'll try to answer that. So the name of the presentation is Artificial Intelligence in Chemistry and Patent Law, Current and Future Issues. So this is a general organization of this presentation. Uh, first, I'll be talking about what is artificial intelligence? What do we mean when we say that? Uh, I'm going to talk about what are possible applications of AI in chemistry, both current and future possible applications. I'm going to talk about issues with AI-generated prior art in patent law, and I'm going to be talking about AI and inventorship. So what do we mean when we say AI? A general definition would be technology that enables computers to simulate human intelligence and problem-solving capabilities. So AI has existed for a while, but the sort of AI that we always see uh, recently mentioned in the news uh, practically every day, including in major newspapers and also smaller technical uh, types of news sources, uh, that AI is large language model AI, and that enables computers to achieve language generation and other natural language processing tasks, such as classification. Uh, people also call this generative AI. Uh, this type of AI was originally invented uh, for language translation um, um, and has now been extended um, to other capabilities. Um, some interesting things about large language model AIs is these things can be multimodal. The, and what I mean by that is the input and output don't have to be language. The input and output could be video, image, audio, text, chemical structures, or even for robotics applications, 3D movement. A couple terms I want to talk about that I'll be using through this presentation and that you'll hear Often, if you read about AI, uh, and I put, preface this with future because it does not yet exist, but artificial general intelligence, also called AGI, is a type of AI that matches or surpasses human abilities across a wide range of cognitive tasks. And another type of AI that you hear referred to is called artificial superintelligence, or ASI. Again, this does not yet exist. This is a type of AI 
with intellect far beyond human intelligence. So what are some possible applications of AI today? Generative or LLM AIs, basically what they do is predict what a person would do based on the materials used to train it. Uh, so although some current AIs can approach the abilities of an average human being in certain areas, the current predominant sentiment is that we have not yet accomplished AGI or artificial general intelligence, which would require human-like performance in all areas. But even with these limitations, current AI can still be a very powerful tool as it can do the work of many average scale human beings in a very short time period with essentially no human labor required. Uh, so current AI, it essentially can give you the, uh, a, a small army at your fingertips of, of, of average intelligence or slightly less than average intelligence human beings, especially in a very specific technical area. Uh, one sort of theme I'm going to start gravitating toward at this point is this idea of just how helpful AIs can be with scientific research and discovery. I know many of you uh, have spent time in the lab doing research, and perhaps you, like me, uh, notice that uh, laboratory research is full of, uh, 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 although it's very exciting, uh, the sorts of results you can generate, it's full of menial tasks, many simple tasks, often that each required an enormous amount of human labor and time, but that do not necessarily require super intelligence or even a high degree of training to carry out. And I'm thinking back to my time in the lab, running reactions, running NMR samples down to the NMR lab. I'm thinking about analyzing spectra, uh, running mass spectrometry samples, recrystallizing materials, uh, uh, um, and of course, column chromatography. AIs are currently poised to make scientific research and discovery much more efficient. AIs can rapidly perform simple tasks that would take a significant time for one, uh, hun tens, hun hundreds, or even thousands of people to perform. And it's exciting that AI development is rapidly evolving and generating an enormous amount of commercial interest. Uh, and that's evidenced by the continual pulse of articles uh, in newspapers talking about AI and the sorts of products that technology companies are coming out with that embrace AI. So here's a small sampling of what Google spits back when you try to do a search for AI tools for lawyers. Now, note that I did not validate this list. I cannot assure you that any of these uh, uh, specifically are suitable uh, for use uh, uh, for, for an attorney. Um, and that's because attorneys have very specific needs uh, for AI tools. What are some of the special considerations for AI tools for lawyers? Well, first and foremost, and this is incredibly important, uh, an AI that you're going to feed confidential information to, you have to be sure it's going to keep that confidential information private and secure. And most AIs don't do this. When you feed it information, it, it trains on your prompt and that information becomes incorporated into its training database. Uh, it's very important that if an attorney is gonna use an AI that they have a guarantee that that information is, is, is not gonna spread out and, and go to people who should not have it. Um, so this, this, this point can't be understated. This is incredibly important and it doesn't necessarily just extend to lawyers. If you have a new invention that you're discussing with an AI, you should make sure that that information is kept private. Uh, if you're a scientist working on discovering new information that you wanna keep secret, uh, you should think twice before uh, feeding that information to a, 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 a general utility AI like ChatGPT, uh, it's important that that information be kept uh, secure and private. Another important consideration for attorneys is that the AI should be trained in the specific legal area we're used. There's all kinds of nuances to the many different uh, areas of law where people work and an AI that doesn't know any of those things is not going to be much help uh, until it's trained. 
Uh, another very important consideration, uh, um, really for any field, but I, I think it's very important for, for law too, the answer quality has to be high with minimal or no errors or hallucinations. Uh, we know that LLM uh, uh, AIs, as they imitate people, they can sometimes just generate things out of thin air because it sounds like what a people would write or say. And uh, I, I'm sure at least a few of you have heard of a situation uh, that I read about recently where an attorney generated a brief using an LLM and the brief contained fake citations to cases that didn't exist, including, including quotes uh, from the cases. And this was caught by the court and I'm sure it was very embarrassing for that attorney. This is a lesson to, to us all that uh, uh, AI outputs need to be cross-checked. So ideally AI tools for attorneys, when they try to spit out a fact and, and, and assert it as a fact, uh, that AI really should include references to source documents whenever possible. And the attorney using the tool uh, needs to verify uh, 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 the output of that AI. And of course, last but not least, attorneys are not computer scientists, at least uh, most of them are not. There's lots of computer scientist attorneys at my firm, but in any case, uh, uh, for that reason, a, a legal AI tool needs to be user-friendly, needs to be easy to use. Uh, it, it, maybe this is a good point to, to talk a little bit about what, my, what sorts of things may have inspired me to give this presentation, uh, 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 I'm sure my, my lifelong consumption of science fiction uh, may have contributed. Uh, my love of all things uh, uh, involving bleeding edge technology uh, certainly contributed. But I can tell you the thing that really inspired me to talk about AI and law and chemistry is my own experiences using AI tools provided by my firm. Um, these are secure, uh, AI tools. None of them appeared on the list I showed you on the previous slide. Uh, AI tools designed for patent attorneys. But I was just blown away playing with these AI tools, what they could do. And here's a few examples of things that might be very useful to a patent attorney uh, that AI tools can do. For example, if you have two very complex documents that are similar but organized differently, packed with experimental information, uh, uh, a prompt to the AI, tell me what things are disclosed in reference A that are not disclosed in reference B. And I want you to organize the output into a short organized outline. Um, our AI tools and can generate that output uh, rapidly and do a great job. Uh, 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 th that sort of a, uh, analysis can save tons of time. Uh, 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 and allow an attorney to take a given budget and make it stretch much further. They'd be able to do much more for that same amount of budget. And another example, uh, um, doing a, a, a search, uh, an invalidity search for a claim set, um, you get a large pile of references back. Um, when feeding these to an AI, uh, uh, the AI, when asked, which of these references can be used to, to best present an anticipation argument against claim one. Uh, these AI tools do a great job um, just determining which uh, of a large number of documents, let's say 30 to 100 documents, which ones are the best anticipatory documents. And something else I found that's very interesting is that uh, some of the AI tools we have, they're very good at patent law, but they don't know a lot about chemistry. And, and, and one situation I ran into is uh, uh, this, this AI didn't understand that uh, when, I, when I say the word polypropylene, that I want to include polypropylene copolymers too. So for, ex for example, polymers that include propylene monomers, ethylene monomers, and butylene monomers. Uh, uh, I told the AI that that's what I wanted it to do. I wanted it to include copolymers, and I gave some examples of copolymers, and I had it repeat the analysis on a large set of documents, and it refined its analysis, and it learned. Uh, frankly, I was blown away that, that that technology exists right now, something that can save us so much time. And it's, it's really, it's one thing to talk about AI tools abstractly. It's another thing to actually see it helping you do something that you need to do for your job. Um, so that's, that's one of my major inspirations.
for giving this presentation. What about AI tools for patent examiners? Um, announced on February, 2022, uh, the more like this feature uh, uh, has been added uh, in, in the patents end-to-end -end or PE2E search tool. This is a tool the patent examiners use uh, to search for prior art uh, when they start to examine your claims. This more like this feature uses AI algorithms to generate a list of domestic or foreign patent documents that are similar to a specific patent document. So examiners have access to AI too. And also part of this 2022 announcement it was the announcement of other types of AI uh, uh, technologies that the USPTO is considering adding in the future, such as AI features that generate suggestions for prior art references, AI features that refine document sorting, that add insight into AI reasoning, and that provide additional cooperative patent classification suggestions. So I look forward to seeing further news on how the USPTO uh, expands the abilities of examiners with AI. Let's talk about AI in chemistry. I was amazed to find how many specific tools there are out there right now that are specifically designed to help organic synthetic chemists. Specifically, these are tools that allow you to input a molecule and they perform a retrosynthesis, which is basically they work backwards to tell you what materials could be used to make your target molecule. Uh, and all of these different products use AI uh, in order to do that. Uh, some of these are major companies and some of these are very recent uh, products like this IBM product. Uh, some of these are, are open source. Um, some of these are from major companies, Elsevier, uh, some of these are conversions of, of search products that have existed for a long time, like SciFinder N from uh, Chemical Abstract Service. Um, um, I have not had a chance to play with any of these tools. Uh, I would love a chance to. I'm really impressed by how many of them there are. So AI can help determine how to synthesize a molecule. AIs can control that that. Uh, that search or output uh, depending on your needs. Let's say you have only certain of in, uh, materials available in the lab. Uh, you could ask the AI, how do I make this, this compound with just the materials I have? Or how do I make this compound um, in the greenest way possible, right? With the least toxic waste? Or how do I make this compound in the most scalable way? Uh, right. If I'm looking at making large amounts of something, it's important that that the reactions be scalable. How do I make this compound without using any chromatography? Uh, might might be an input that these types of products could help you with rapidly. And again, this is something that would ordinarily take a team of PhD chemists to determine. Uh, uh, using one of these tools, a, a single chemist can sit and work with the AI and and, and do the work of many people. Uh, very quickly, which can drastically speed up scientific discovery. I was also, I was amazed to see uh, that there's there's journals now that specialize in artificial intelligence and chemistry. And this would be a really good resource for any of you who want to learn about the various applications of AI and chemistry. I can only touch on a few of them here. I'm concentrating on organic synthesis and drug discovery, uh, just because those are generally such important topics, but there's tons of other things that AIs can do in chemistry. And I've given one example of an article here that I, I thought was very good and give a nice summary. Uh, uh, but one thing I wanna point out here is, look how new this journal is. Uh, this is 2024, this is just volume two. Uh, um, so this is a really new, this is a really new journal. So what kinds of things can AI do in chemistry? Um, AI can perform literature review. AI can, as we talked about, propose synthetic routes to target compounds. Uh, AI can assist with laboratory synthesis of target compounds. And there's lots of information out there about this. And I'm sure this will continue expanding. And this goes back to what I talked about earlier about uh, a lot of mundane 
easy, simple tasks being involved in laboratory research, lab laboratories can be made with uh, uh, to be roboticized, and AIs can conduct uh, those robots. Uh, um, so la robotic laboratories, it's a real thing. It happens, and they're just getting better. Uh, um, they will they will only improve. Screening of target compounds, early stage identification of promising candidate compounds based on uh, ease of synthesis, potential activity against the target, and or actual activity against the target. Uh, uh, one thing I saw a lot of as I researched for this presentation uh, was the ability of AIs to generate inputs for computational chemistry software uh, and then be able to take that output and make further decisions on what to do. Uh, that's an amazing amount of automation and, and takes a, a lot of human labor uh, out of the process. Um, of course, characterization in analytical chemistry. How much time have we spent uh, analyzing spectra, determining what types of spectra to collect, uh, what sort of tests to run on a compound in order to determine what it is? Um, AI is well poised uh, to be trained on how to interpret spectra and do this very well. Data analysis, AI is very good at finding patterns in data. And of course, writing up results. And just as an example, I'll talk a bit about AI use in drug design. There's a lot of information out there about this. Um, AIs can be used to identify biological pathways that are implicated in specific diseases. AI can identify potential biological targets for disease treatment. Uh, AI can, can use computational chemistry or literature to predict new bioactive compounds or new uses for no known compounds. And AI can be used, as we've talked about, to pr pr predict efficient synthetic routes toward a target compound and or selection of candidate compounds that can be efficiently synthesized. And I talked about this a bit before, but they can optimize for low cost, scalability, green synthesis, uh, or other types of efficiency considerations or a combination thereof. AI in pharmaceutical screening and clinical trials can be used um, um, in automated high throughput screening against a target, uh, identification and optimization of lead compounds. Um, and they can also be used to predict drug properties. Um, this could be based on literature review uh, uh, of other similar molecules, computational uh, chemistry, uh, um, and these properties can involve things like solubility, bioavailability, toxicity, or prediction of drug-drug interactions. And of course, AI can be very helpful in analyzing clinical trial data. AIs are, are very good at finding patterns and characterizing them in data. So as I hunted around, I noticed that there's a certain subset of pharmaceutical companies out there that openly advertise themselves as specializing in drug discovery. And I've given a list here of the companies who openly advertise that, uh, I just want to point out that I don't think that drug discovery uh, it, that uses AI is limited to this list. I suspect that all major drug companies are using AI to some extent, uh, but these are these are companies that openly advertise it and are making a, a deliberate effort uh, to, to to make heavy use of AI in the drug discovery process. And I've just uh, I've given a few recent examples here uh, uh, of, of one of these companies from that list, which is in silico medicine. Uh, this company has developed 18 preclinical candidates since 2021 in under three years. Um, and they've recently announced um, several different types of cancer treatment compounds and are launching a phase one study on this compound, uh, ISM 3412. Um, um, a, 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 a phase one study in human subjects with advanced and metastatic solid tumors. So I think it's only a matter of time before we see AIs successfully being used to bring a drug to market. And, and honestly, this is just the tip of the iceberg, I think, because AIs are gonna be used across industries. And as time goes on, we're gonna see more and more examples 
of, of AI assisted or, or even almost AI originated um, uh, materials. Uh, I don't know if origination is the right term at this point with the current smartness of AI uh, uh, being sort of only average or sub-average. Maybe it's a little above average if it's highly trained, uh, uh, but um, uh, I, I think AIs are gonna contribute to important discoveries in the future. And that's just gonna continue to accelerate uh, uh, the public interest in the use of AI. So there's a lot of scientific goals that fall within the chemical arts that AI could potentially help with. And again, we're, we're at average or sub-average AI right now, but as, as they get smarter, uh, um, I think they'll be more and more useful uh, um, for, for accomplishing scientific goals within the chemical arts. And of course, I've talked about drug discovery, uh, always important, uh, uh, but you know, falling more squarely in my practice area would be uh, anytime you have materials, compounds or polymers that you want with specific desired properties. And AI might be very useful in helping you determine uh, what those materials may be. Uh, um, you know, and as, as, we, as we get into the future with, with smarter and better AIs, there's all kinds of scientific goals within the chemical arts that could, that could uh, the, the solutions to which uh, could change humanity things like cold fusion, curing cancer or disease, uh, preventing or slowing aging. And uh, a, a hypothesis I'm giving uh, 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 is that current or future AIs, um, such as ASIs or AGIs, which do not yet exist, could contribute to or do the brunt of the work in important future discoveries within the chemical arts. And I think this has important implications for what's gonna happen uh, uh, to inventorship. And that's something I'll get to toward the end of this presentation. But let's start first by talking about AI generated prior art. So as we know, AIs can generate documents that can be published. AIs can, can generate on their own or assist to generate papers, patent applications, or any sort of publication that's, that's discoverable on the internet, that's, that, that's indexed, searchable. Uh, AIs can also generate false or hallucinated information. And importantly, AIs can generate lots of information with very little human labor. Uh, uh, so what are, we, what are we looking at uh, as far as what's the, what, how is that going to change prior art? Uh, um, as far as AI-generated chemical prior art, um, this could include chemical structures or properties, right? This could include huge sets of chemical structures, chemical structures of materials that have never been made before, uh, uh, large disclosures. This could include disclosures of synthetic methods. I think it's important to point out um, um, new AI developments and they're appearing all the time. Uh, I was a little concerned that uh, Apple traditionally likes to announce their products on, on this Tuesday. I was worried that Apple's uh, product announcement would, would usurp this presentation and would draw people away from it. Uh, uh, fortunately, uh, Apple chose to give their presentation on a Monday, uh, but maybe some of you saw it. Uh, uh, right now, Apple, like many other companies, is highlighting AI in their products. And many, many aspects of their presentation yesterday uh, highlighted some of the new things that AI is going to bring to their next model of phones. And that includes a, 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 you know, a, much, uh, a, a much needed update to Apple Siri, but it also includes all kinds of other things like uh, uh, ability to manipulate photos, uh, uh, summarization of reminders, uh, writing assistance in email. Uh, and Windows has had Copilot for some time now. Um, you know, the, the main point is that we're all going to have AI in our pocket, uh, um, in our phones, and on our computers. And it's going to be everywhere. And this is happening or already has happened. And this is just this is just the tip of the iceberg, right? This is just the first year that these technology companies have had a chance to work on this stuff, and it's only going to get better. Uh, AI integrated into word processing software that will help you write, right? The same way that Microsoft Word will uh, currently suggest uh, alternative wordings when you don't use your grammar well. 
uh, um, AI can, can suggest a lot more and potentially compose whole parts of your documents for you. And this could come as a built-in plug, this could come as a plug-in in Word, or it could be a built-in component of the software. Uh, um, so the hypothesis here is that some degree of AI assistance is or will be a component of everything that humans publish at some point. It's going to be very difficult to get away from this. And the amount of efficiency that it can add is going to be irresistible. Uh, um, and, and, you know, this leads to sort of the next future hypothesis here is will AIs in the future help with or do a great deal of the work in, in most scientific discovery? So what does the USPTO have to tell us about AI-generated prior art? Uh, um, well, currently, I think they're working on suggestions because very recently there was a request for comments, and this is entitled uh, Comments Regarding the Impact of the Proliferation of Artificial Intelligence on Prior Art, the Knowledge of a Person Having Ordinary Skill in the Art, and Determinations of Patentability Made in View of the Foregoing. Uh, the comments were due, uh, th this was just announced in April this year. And the comments were due at the end of July. I tried to look at submissions. They appear to be private. Uh, however, they did have a listening session where, where people could uh, openly give their comments. And it appears that uh, um, this was at the end of July also, right before the comments were due. Uh, you can actually go view and listen to this right now if you're interested in, in hearing what the public has to say. And the, the main things that USPTO appears to be going after in this request for comments, uh, um, uh, first, this issue of, of the presumption of enablement of prior art. Prior art, when an examiner cites prior art, uh, it's presumed to enable the public to make and use the disclosure. Should AI-generated prior art be afforded the same presumption, or should it be treated differently? Another major thing that the USPTO seems to be considering is, is the standard of skill of, of a person having ordinary skill in the art. This is commonly used in patent law as sort of a, a determination of, of, of how smart is the person who's, who's out there looking at the prior art references. If, if the person having ordinary skill in the art has very high skill, then they'd be very adept at assembling features uh, from from disparate references, whereas if the uh, level of skill is low, uh, um, it, it's it's it would be easier to argue against a rejection involving multiple references. So uh, with with AI out there, AI like I said, AI in all of our pockets on our on our phones on our computers. Does that mean that a person having ordinary skill in the art uh, does that have to be a natural person, or should it be a, a, a person? that's augmented with AI such that the skill level needs to be higher. So let's talk about enablement first. Uh, as I said, prior art is presumed to enable the public to make and use the disclosure. I thought it was interesting that the USPTO's request, it appears to restrict the inquiry to, uh, quote, AI generated disclosures that have not been prepared and reviewed by a human. So I think this is interesting because it, to me, it, it seems like it might implicitly acknowledge that AI-assisted publications should be subjected to normal prior art rules. I think it would be problematic to treat AI-generated prior art differently than other types of prior art. And I think the reason is that AI is soon going to be a component of everything published, or at least most things. And I think it is, or may become difficult, to quantify the degree of AI assistance. How do I know if something is exclusively generated by AI, or if it's merely AI assisted? Uh, I think it could be difficult to determine whether a human participated at all, or to what extent a human participated in the preparation and review of a document. And a few examples here is, is, is if I just review the output of an AI uh, and make no changes, is that sufficient to make the document no longer AI generated prior art if I've checked it and validated it? Um, um, or what if I only make small changes? You know, is that enough? 
uh, what if 99.99% of it is from the AI? If dramatically different treatment occurs for AI generated prior art, I think this could burn up a lot of time and energy. Uh, a lot of time and energy may get spent on trying to determine whether a reference is AI generated. Um, so when I say enablement, this is sometimes called operability, whether the reference is operable. This means can a person having ordinary skill in the art make and use what is disclosed in that document? So the, 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 the test is on the reader. Uh, uh, it, it really shouldn't have anything to do with how the document was made. It's the effect of the prior art on someone reading it that seems like it should be more important than how the document was generated. Uh, if an AI can generate an enabling document, uh, 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 can, if an AI can, can, dis, can give a chemical structure and explain how it's made and, and describe how it's characterized so, so that we have proof it really is what they say, there's no reason that that document should be treated any differently than a human generated document. And something to keep in mind is that uh, in, in patent law, although there's this presumption of enablement, uh, when an examiner cites to a document, uh, um, there is an option for the applicant or, or patent attorney, and that's to rebut that presumption of enablement. If there is no enablement of a cited reference, the presumption of enablement of the reference can be rebutted. How, how can we do that? And I've given a, a couple examples here uh, specific to chemistry. The MPEP is instructive. For example, uh, for compounds and compositions, uh, one of ordinary skill must be able to, to make or synthesize that compound or, syn or, or, or composition in order to rebut a presumption of enablement of a compound or composition. The applicant can supply facts showing that a process for making the compound was not known, is not given in the document, is not given anywhere else in the prior art. And uh, uh, additionally, a reference does not contain an enabling disclosure if attempts at making the compound or composition were previously unsuccessful. And this goes for a case where the, the document itself uh, um, does not list a successful way of making the compound, of course. And I know this, comp this presentation is supposed to be about chemistry, but I, I couldn't resist putting in this section here on plant genetics. Uh, the same, same rule goes for plants, those of ordinary skill uh, must be able to grow and cultivate the plant in order for it to be an enabled disclosure. What about properties of compounds and compositions? Uh, uh, folks who practice chemical patent law know that if a compound is disclosed, uh, at least if it's enabled, um, that the properties of that compound uh, uh, are inherent, are inherent from the structure, right? If a compound has been made, uh, it has those those properties, whether or not those properties are disclosed, and you can't go along and claim them later as something new. Uh, well, so if you're dealing with properties in prior art uh, um, and, a, and an examiner cites to a compound, uh, um, the question is, is the compound or composition enabled? If, if, it's, if it's not enabled, if there's no clear way to make it for a person having ordinary skill in the art, the properties cannot be inherent from the reference. Uh, for properties listed for non-enabled compounds and compositions, I, I suppose it's possible that an AI could use computational chemistry to predict those properties or give other reasoning. But in general, uh, um, it, it, for properties listed for non-enabled compounds and compositions, I think that we can argue that those properties are not enabled either. So I think that current law, current techniques uh, um, current MPEP sections are already sufficient to deal with the sorts of things we're going to see with AI-generated uh, prior art in chemistry. And this could include AI-assisted or AI-originated publications. What about the impact of AI on the skill level of a person having ordinary skill in the art? If tools are customary for a person having ordinary skill in the art, then does it make sense to adjust the skill level uh, of, of uh, uh, upward to reflect this? Adjusting skill level 
uh, keep in mind that adjusting the skill level uh, of a person having ordinary skill in the, in the art in a certain technical area upwards may increase the difficulty of obtaining patents in that technical area. So it might be tempting to think that we should increase this skill level. However, I'm not sure that it makes sense because at least currently, AIs at best only duplicate or predict what a human would do. We don't yet have ASI, um, which, which might meaningfully change the skill level uh, of, a, of a person having ordinary skill in the art. Therefore, current AIs should not change the skill level. That's what I believe. And even, even the development of artificial general intelligence um, shouldn't change this logic. Um, however, in the future, as AIs get smarter, such as uh, artificial super intelligence, I think this issue may need to be reevaluated. But as long as AIs are only predicting what an average person would do, I don't think it makes sense to change this skill level. And even if ASIs do come along, I think uh, it doesn't just automatically mean we should raise the skill level. I think it depends on how many people have access to ASIs. If there's only a few people in the world that have access to it, or if access is incredibly expensive and uh, it is restricted uh, for most people having ordinary skill in that art, uh, even then it doesn't ne necessarily make sense to, to, to push that level up. So let's talk about AI and inventorship. We, we know that an AI cannot be an inventor on a US patent. Um, on appeal, the Federal Circuit affirmed this in Thaler versus Vidal in 2022, uh, the holding that only a natural person can be an inventor. So an AI cannot be. The court stated that that uh, 35 USC 100F defines an inventor as the individual, or if a joint invention, the individuals collectively who invented or discovered the subject matter of the invention. Based on, and this is the court, based on Supreme Court precedent, the word individual when used in statutes ordinarily means a human being, unless Congress provided some indication that a different meaning was intended. Therefore, an inventor must be a natural person. But note, the court was not confronted with the question of whether inventions made by human beings with the assistance of AI are eligible for patent protection or not. The, the USPTO has given us uh, um, actually more guidance on this subject than they have about prior art. They're still working. I mean, they've just asked for comments on the impact of AI on prior art. They haven't given us guidelines yet, but here for AI assisted inventions, they've given us guidelines uh, published in February, 2024. And the USPTO reiterates what I showed on the prior slide, inventors must be natural persons, even when the AI has been instrumental in the creation of the claimed invention. Uh, AI inf assisted inventions are not categorically unpatentable for improper inventorship though. Although an AI system cannot be named as an inventor, an AI system, like other tools, may perform acts that, if performed by a human, could constitute inventorship. But patent protection may only be sought for inventions for which a natural person provided a significant contribution. A natural person must provide a significant contribution to each claim. So we have this significant contribution standard. A human being has to provide a significant contribution. So what's gonna happen in the future here? Uh, as AIs become more capable, uh, for example, with the advent of AGI or ASI, less human assistance will be needed to produce a patentable invention. Uh, AIs do or will have the ability to review portions of or even all of the literature, run experiments in robotic chemistry laboratories, and generate data. AI assistance will become the norm, uh, I believe, with writing, with data analysis, with literature review, and with the possibility of, of, of AI-run uh, 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 robotic laboratories 
possibly even with experimentation. Uh, at some point, if AIs get smart enough, uh, smart in quotes, uh, AIs may originate inventions from simple non-inventive prompts. So I guess a question just to think about, uh, um, could the significant human contribution standard put AI assisted inventions at a disadvantage? Uh, consider a scenario where an AI assisted invention could be patentable other than the lack of a human inventor. While if a human discovers the same invention, it is patentable. Even if what the AI has done would be enough for patentability, if a human had done the same thing, more human involvement would be required to stat satisfy the human inventorship standard. So for an entity seeking patent protection of their AI assisted discoveries, could the, this significant human contribution standard be characterized at, uh, as anti-AI and as disincentivizing or punishing heavy, heavy use of AI in scientific research? Well, what if we lowered the significant contribution standard? Uh, uh, that might be one idea. Uh, uh, for how to move forward? What if we allowed humans who contributed less or little to be inventors? Uh, I think that if we did that, there would be severe adverse effects. I think that that could degrade the normal standard of inventorship and determining who's inventor on a patent is extremely important. Uh, 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 the inventors are the initial owners of a patent uh, patent application before it's assigned to the folks that employ them. Uh, um, everybody who owns a patent application uh, has to agree in order to assert that patent in court. Um, so if the determination of who is an inventor becomes uh, hazy or less definite, uh, this could severely impact the potential value of patents. So I think the answer is in the USPTO guidelines. Um, um, and the answer is, uh, uh, how do we incentivize the use of AI? Um, why, why, why is current law not anti-AI? Well, I think the answer is that prop, the people who draft the prompt to the AI can potentially be inventors. And the people who make the AI and train the AI can, can be inventors. Uh, um, so these, quotes here are taken from the USPTO guidelines. Um, first off, a prompt drafter can be an inventor. A natural person uh, uh, who only presents a problem to an AI system may not be a prompt proper inventor or joint inventor of an invention identified from the output of the AI system. Okay, so there's situations where the prompt drafter is not an inventor, but however, a significant contribution can be shown by the way the person constructs the prompt in view of a specific problem to elicit a particular solution from the AI system. So there are some situations where the prompt drafter could be an inventor of an AI assisted invention. An AI maker trainer can also be an inventor in certain cases. The natural person who designs, builds, or trains an AI system in view of a specific problem to elicit a particular solution could be an inventor where the designing building or training of the AI system is a significant contribution to the invention created with the AI system. So what does this mean about the future as AIs become more capable? Uh, I think that the prospect of the AI maker trainer as inventor may incentivize uh, entities to make the investments needed for development of specialized AGIs or ASIs that can assist with or even originate discovery needed for significant scientific advances. Uh, I envision that in the future, the ability for the prompt drafter or the, the builder trainer of the AI to be inventors is going to generate contracts issues uh, with AI system designers demanding from users uh, partial ownership of inventions created by the AI system, uh, uh, and likewise, users demanding from system designers that any patent ownership of inventions created by the AI system be assigned to the user. Um, and I think that for extremely powerful AI systems of the future, this negotiation could become quite important. 
Uh, so this is an aspect of the law that I expect to see develop as AIs get better. Uh, another interesting thing to consider is when AIs get better or smarter, will there be pressure to make the prompt sufficient for inventorship? Uh, and I, I've, I've simply restated what I read before, and I'm not going to reread it. It's here for your reference. But there's some situations where a natural person could present just a problem, and that's not enough for inventorship. There's other situations where the way the prompt is drafted in view of a specific problem could provide a, a significant contribution. So what if AIs become so smart that simple non-inventive presentation of a problem to an AI is enough to cause the AI to generate an invention? If using an AI creates no inventorship in the user, this might disincentivize the use of AI assistance in scientific discovery by entities that are not the makers or trainers of the AI. And I think this gives rise to a couple interesting things that might happen, which is that uh, prompts could be intentionally designed more complex than they need to be uh, uh, intentionally in order to ensure that a significant contribution is made in the prompt. Uh, or what if the what if the user, the prompt drafter, intentionally designs a prompt to cause the AI to leave something out uh, of, the, of the output, something out uh, for a human inventor to later fill in, so there's still a, a significant contribution made by a human. So what happens to inventorship uh, if and when ASIs are created? I don't know if it's going to be possible uh, to make ASIs. But let's, let's think together for a second about what might happen. Uh, if ASIs are created such that simple presentation of a problem to an AI is enough to cause the AI to generate an invention, a traditional user or purchaser of the software may not even be needed for the ASI to create valuable inventions. Uh, and despite the possibly bizarre effects on inventorship, I think that there's powerful arguments that the creation of highly capable ASI should be incentivized for the betterment of mankind. And I'll ask you to set aside for a second uh, uh, sort of dystopian visions of, of ASIs in the future that you may have from uh, uh, movies such as The Matrix or The Terminator, where AI takes over the world. Uh, hopefully the fact that we're aware of those dangers means that human beings uh, will be able to build ASIs safely if they are able to do it, and that that sort of dystopia would not be the result. Uh, uh, unlike science fiction, I want to try to comp concentrate on the positive side of ASIs. What are the good things that could come from that? And there's a lot of good uh, that could come from that. If humankind has the ability to bring itself into a new and better technological age, then shouldn't they do it? Uh, and and again, this this in, in in the chemical sciences, this can this can include things like achievement of cold fusion, right? Free energy with no waste, cures for cancers, diseases, slowing aging, or achieving of other ultimate scientific goals that could result in huge public benefits. Um, in such a future, how can traditional commercial technology ent entities be incentivized to perform? scientific research and discovery re without the reward of a patent? Would all commercial technology entities become AI makers and trainers? Would all research and development be predominantly performed by ASIs? Well, that's not clear. I think we'll just have to, move to, to wait for the future to happen before uh, uh, we'll find out the answers to those things. I'm not sure how clear we are, how, how close we are to achieving ASIs right now, but I, I do think it will really shake up the inventorship landscape. So uh, closing statements. Uh, again, as a reminder, uh, current AI has not yet achieved AGI or ASI. It's not clear how far away these things are, we'll, we'll, uh, um, whether we'll see these things during our lifetime or not, but it's fun to think about it. Current AI cannot exceed what one or more average human beings could do given enough time. Therefore, I think the current legal framework, which is designed to function with human-generated prior art and human inventors is likely sufficient to deal 
with current AI technology. Uh, I th and uh, it's not, it's, as I said, it's not clear how far away uh, uh, the development of ASI is. However, uh, if ASI does become widely available, and I, I think the, the how widely available it is will influence this, maybe we do need to raise the skill level of a person having ordinary skill in the art. If everybody has access to very intelligent AIs, it will increase their skill level. Um, to increase the, to encourage the use of AI in scientific research, I think the USPTO could offer more clarity on what is required for prompt drafters and AI makers or trainers to make a significant contribution. I think the the the, the word significant the word significant contribution. There's a lot of wiggle room there. It's not really clear what this means. Uh, um, so I I think uh, this will need to get flushed out in the courts or the USPTO could offer some guidance. As AIs become more capable, um, we are likely to see creative prompt making techniques in order to ensure the prompt maker is an inventor. Uh, and I think we're, we're likely to see increasing attention on contracts between uh, AM de AI designers and AI users regarding ownership of patents toward AI assisted inventions. And lastly, if ASIs are created, I think this will radically change the inventorship landscapes and it's possible that AI makers and trainers would be the predominant inventors of patents uh, if truly uh, super intelligent AI AIs are invented. So I'm gonna take questions now if there are any. Oh, and there's a lot of comments here. So I'm gonna go through these in order. Um, again, if you don't, if, if I don't have a chance to get to your question, uh, I love emails. So send me an email. This topic is really interesting to me and I'd love to chat with you. Uh, Let's see here. Okay, there's some comments here saying that a, an AI assistant is taking notes for this meeting. Um, that's interesting. Uh, oh, so there's a copy of the slides in the comments. If you want those, you'll all receive an email to that also. Recursion appears to be doing contract work for big pharma. Um, let's see here. How in, has in silico medicine been able to protect by patents as AI designed drug candidates? That's a good question. I have not uh, uh, researched that and um, um, I will look into that. If you'd like an answer on that, please send me an email. Um, here's a comment, given enough time, lifespan, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if we'll live to see uh, ASI. Uh, um, it would be exciting and kind of frightening if if we did. But um, you know, I, I, I like I said, I think we're humans are smart enough to to learn from from all the stories in science fiction uh, to do it in a safe manner. Well, I will try to address other questions. Um, uh, via via email. So again, send me emails with your questions. Um, thank you so much for attending uh, uh, this first uh, seminar of the SLW Life Sciences series. We'll be giving these on the second Tuesday of each month. Again, if you attend three or more uh, of these sessions live, we will send you a, a free gift. Um, the next seminar is going to be on October 8th, uh, just to whet your appetite, this is gonna be given by Dr. Stephen Reed. Uh, the title would be 
patenting solid forms of pharmaceuticals. And uh, um, this was going to, uh, a synopsis is the presentation will focus on the role of crystalline and amorphous forms of pharmaceuticals in the life cycle of drugs, placing particular emphasis on patentability challenges and strategies. In view of the global importance of drug patents, the presentation will touch upon challenges in procuring solid forms uh, uh, patents in representative foreign jurisdictions. So I hope you'll join us on October 8th for the next uh, seminar. Thank you so much for your attention today.